In this lesson, we will learn how to use CSS to add styling to our HTML forms. Let's dive right in by looking at the finished product. So on this example page, we can see that here is a form. We learned in the HTML section of this course that forms are how we can receive input from users. So for example, a visitor of the website could click here to enter their email address, test at test.com. This field receives their password. Perhaps they want to choose what screen they are initially presented with when they log in. And then this button submits their input. Now we are not going to actually submit the form data in this lesson. This is not a course on PHP or Ruby on Rails or server side JavaScript. This is a course on HTML and CSS. So this lesson is simply about making forms look pretty. Now we've been looking at an example of a form that is styled. And we all know that looking at a finished product isn't very educational, but I wanted us to be on the same page. So now let's switch over to the tab that we will be working on together and let out a collective sigh of disappointment that this sorry state of affairs is how web browsers render forms by default. I think most people will agree that hands down, this is prettier and feels easier to use than this, but that's okay. That's why web designers exist. It's our job to whip this form into shape so that it looks like something people will actually want to interact with. And that's exactly what we're going to do in this lesson. We're going to write all of the CSS code together. Let's get started. All right. I want to begin by making this field and this field take up the full available width, or in other words, I want each field to sit on its own row. Now, before we write the CSS to select this element, let's take a quick look at our HTML. So that first field uses a type of email. So now let's try to select this element in our CSS. I'll create a new comment to stay organized. Form styles. So we can see that that element is an input. So I'll begin with a type selector input, but we don't want to select all inputs on the page because for example, this checkbox is an input. So we need to make our selector a bit more specific. We only want to select inputs that use a type of email. And now we can string together declarations and create our styles. So I want it to take up the full available width, 100%. To keep things as predictable as possible, I will also set display block. And because we set a width of 100%, I also want to set box sizing to use border box. So this way we can specify horizontal padding without our field becoming wider than 100%. So box sizing border box simply changes the way that the browser calculates overall width values. So this code will play together very nicely and very quickly. Let's also set a baseline height. Let's try 40 pixels. We are making progress. This field now sits on its own row. Next, let's make sure that these styles that we just wrote also get applied to the password field. So all we need to do is adjust our selector for this rule. I'm going to copy this, add a comma, paste the code back in and change email to password. Now for this particular form, those are the only types of inputs that I will need to select. But in most projects, you will probably want to be sure to also include input types of text, number, and tell for telephone. The alternative to using these attribute type selectors would be to simply create a reusable class, for example, something like standard field, and then adding that class to every input that you wanted to style. However, these attribute type selectors allow us to not dirty up our HTML with unnecessary classes. So this is my preferred way of doing things. Next, let's style the actual form parent element itself. So let's give it a background color and a bit of padding. So in our CSS, we want to select the parent form element. Let's give it a background color of EC, which is a light gray. Let's give it 30 pixels vertical padding and 40 pixels horizontal padding. Excellent. Next, let's hide these labels for the email and password fields. Because we are using the placeholder attribute on those two fields, we can see that before we even enter any text in the field, we are given a hint by the placeholder text. So I know that I'm supposed to enter my email in this field. 
which makes the traditional label element a bit redundant. However, we do not want to simply go into our HTML and delete the label element. We want it here for accessibility reasons and for fallback reasons and all sorts of reasons. So what we're going to do instead is add a class to it. I will use a name of hidden label. You could use any class name that you would like. Now let's construct a class or a rule in our CSS for that name, hidden label. Now you want to be careful. You don't want to simply say display none because certain screen reading software will interpret display none as, oh, I will just ignore this content completely. So we don't want this. Instead, we can use position absolute to pull the element out of the natural flow of the page and then set its height to zero, its width to zero, set its overflow to hidden, and even set its visibility to hidden. So this way, the label is hidden visually for most traditional browsers and devices, but screen reading devices will still be able to access the label and successfully associate it with this field. So we're in good shape. Now we just need to add that class to the password field. So here is the label for the password field. Let's give it a class of hidden label. Excellent. Now let's resume fine tuning these two fields. If we look closely, we can see that these fields are using a different font family than the rest of our page. And this raises an important point. The font that we set on our HTML or body element that we expect to trickle down to the entire page does not get trickled down to form elements. So we need to specifically set that. So in this rule where we are selecting the inputs, we need to re-specify the font that we want to use. So font family, I'm using Tahoma with a fallback to the system sans serif. And let's also set the size to be normal. So font size 100%. Perfect. Now let's create a bit of vertical space between these two fields. So we can apply margin bottom. Let's try 15 pixels. Great. Now let's override the browser default border that is getting applied to these fields border, one pixel solid. I will use a light gray CD. It is a subtle border, but it's there if you look closely. Something to keep in mind is that we need to give users visual feedback, letting them know which field they are currently working with. So let's use CSS to add a green border around the field that is currently being used. And let's also add an inline shadow. We will need to create a new rule, but I'm going to use these selectors as a baseline. So I'm going to copy. Let's create a new rule, paste those in. Now we've already selected these inputs in their default state, but now we want to select them in their focused state. So only when the user is currently focusing on one of these inputs do we want these new styles that we're going to write in just a second to be applied. All right, so we want to change the border to use a green color. I'll paste that in. And we also wanted to add an inline shadow. So we can use the box shadow property, include the inset keyword. I want the shadow to be fairly small and subtle. So two pixels, horizontal and vertical offset with a two pixel blur. Let's use a very transparent black value. So by default, our fields will look like this, but when a user clicks or tabs to one, we can see the green border and the subtle shadow. Next, let's style the sign in button. We will circle back around to styling this select box in just a moment, but for now, let's give this sign in button some attention. So in our HTML, we can see that the sign in button has a type of submit. So in our CSS, let's create a new rule input with a type of submit. So that's how we can select the sign in button. Let's begin by making the button take up the full available width. So some of these styles will be similar to what we've already written for the first two fields, but the exact combination isn't identical. So it does warrant a new rule. So width 100%, let's go ahead and set display to block. Let's use box sizing border box. Let's use a green background color. I'll paste in a hexadecimal color code. Let's make the text use a color of white. So let's see how that looks so far. 
So immediately I see that I want to add a bit of vertical padding and also let's add a custom border color. Padding, 10 pixels vertically. Border, one pixel solid and I'll use a slightly darker green. I think it would look nice if the button had slightly rounded corners. So let's try border radius three pixels. It's subtle, but I like it. Also, we see again that the font for the button is not using the default font that we've set for the page. So let's go adjust this rule that we set up earlier, where we added font family and font size to all these different types of selectors. Let's actually cut those two lines and create a completely universal type selector for simply all inputs. So that way these styles will be applied to all of these types of inputs and inputs that have a type of submit. Much better. Next, let's add a bit of margin bottom to this button and also create hover or focus styles for it. So let's try margin bottom, 10 pixels. And also when someone hovers over the submit button or gives it focus by cycling to it with the tab button on their keyboard, we wanna style it differently. So input type submit when it's hovered and also when it has the focus. We wanna style it differently. So I'm just gonna paste in rules because I don't want this video to become too long. So now when we hover over the button, you can see that it changes. Or if we start here and then use our keyboard to tab, you can see the styles change as well. And all that I pasted in there was simply a new border color and a new background color. So not rocket science. Now let's circle back to the dreaded select element. The reason I used the word dreaded in this case is because we don't always have complete 100% control over how the select element is styled. But let's begin by giving it our best shot. So in our CSS, let's tack on the select element at the end of our baseline styles for inputs. Not bad. Let's also be sure to include select in this rule that applies baseline font settings. Even better. Now it seems that the select element is playing along quite nicely and you might be wondering why I used the word dreaded. Well, we've only seen this page rendered in Mozilla Firefox. That's what we're currently viewing. Let me pull this page up in Google Chrome. So now we can see that the select element has rounded corners. And even if we specifically select the select element and say WebKit border radius zero and simply border radius zero, Chrome will still not remove the rounded corners. And this is where things begin to get a bit crazy. So at this point, if you were completely determined to remove these darn rounded corners in Google Chrome, you could go perform a web search for how do I remove rounded corners in Chrome on the select element and you might discover that you can use a property named WebKit Appearance and provided a value of none and we can see that that did the trick <laughs> but I would encourage you to stop and look in the mirror and ask yourself what are you doing? Do you really want to open this can of worms? Do you really want to try and override the default behavior of every operating system and web browser combination on the planet? Meaning certain form elements, like the select element for example, will appear differently on Chrome for Windows than they may on Chrome for Mac. And we also have Opera, Internet Explorer, Chrome for Android, a whole slew of other mobile browsers and other mobile operating systems. So every combo is going to have slightly different looking form inputs. Some of them have their own proprietary properties that you will need to override, and it can get very messy and very time consuming very quickly. Now for certain projects, you don't need to worry so much about the appearance of your forms. However, certain projects have corporate agendas or corporate branding requirements and you will need to heavily focus on the appearance of forms in the description for this lecture you will find links to popular pre-existing css bundles that you can copy and paste into your project which will take care of a lot of the cross-browser heavy lifting work for you 
Having said that, let's end this lecture with a few final customizations which we can make quite easily. So in Firefox, you will remember that when we click on one of these fields, it lights up with a green border, and we created that style manually. However, over in Google Chrome, when we click on a field, and this happens in other browsers as well, we can see a blue outline or a blue glow. And you will often want to remove this. So to do that, all we need to do in the rule for our baseline inputs, simply add a declaration, outline, none. So now in Chrome, the email and password fields do not have the outline, neither does the select, but the submit button still does. So be sure to include outline none there as well. Perfect. And finally, let's imagine that we want to adjust the text that reads stay signed in to be smaller and perhaps use a gray color. Now in our HTML, we can see that that text lives in a span that has a class of checkbox text. And I want to take this opportunity to remind you that you can use whatever markup you need to within your form. Now obviously you should try to keep your HTML as clean and as semantic as possible. But if you need a bit of extra style here and there, feel free to use the span element. And even though we didn't cover it in this lesson, if you needed to create different columns within your form, feel free to use divs. So back to our specific example, we want to target this text. So let's just create a new rule. Checkbox text, font size 85%, color, Let's try a medium gray, and that looks a lot better. And that will bring this lesson on styling forms to a close. Again, if you need a bit more horsepower in wrangling in some of those cross-browser differences, be sure to check out the description for this lesson. I will include links to popular CSS bundles that you can plug into your projects. I encourage you to experiment with your own form designs. Have fun, and I will see you in the next lesson.